Hey everyone, Chris here. Today we're going to talk about Joe Namath and should he be in the Hall of Fame. So let's start with a few statistics first of all. As a starting quarterback, he had 62 wins, 63 losses, and 4 ties. He completed 50.1% of his passes, threw for a total of 27,663 yards, which is good for 67th place on the all-time list. He threw for 173 touchdowns compared to 220 interceptions. And in the postseason, he was 2-1. Uh, and one. So now that includes the fact that it, he last appeared in a postseason game in 1969 when he was 26 years old. The only two wins he had was the year that they won the Super Bowl, when they won Super Bowl three. So we'll get back to um, talking a little bit about that and should he be in the Hall of Fame and, and where that discussion comes from. Um, let me give you a little bit of background information on him first. Um, he was born in the western part of Pennsylvania in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. And in high school, he played three sports. He played baseball, football, and basketball and was very good at all three of those sports. Now, uh, in football, he wore for his jersey number, he was number 19 because Johnny Unitas was his idol growing up. And in baseball, he had another idol, which was Roberto Clemente. And he actually wanted to follow in the footsteps of Clemente and play baseball professionally for the Pittsburgh Pirates. But his mom kind of had other ideas. His mom wanted him to go to college and get a, a college education. So he originally committed to play for uh, Maryland Terra for the Maryland Terrapins and didn't have quite good enough uh, uh, college entrance exam scores to get in there. So he ended up going and playing for legendary coach Bear Bryant at Alabama. Um, they ended up winning a national championship while he was there. And uh, there he actually, against NC State, I think it was his junior year. Uh, no, actually, I think it was his senior year. It was the first time that he actually had a knee injury and uh, ended up kind of messing his knee up. And he would kind of later always kind of be dealing with different knee injuries and that kind of thing, which I think really affected his play as he got older and even throughout his whole career. Now, when he graduated from Alabama, um, he was drafted in both the NFL and the AFL. In the NFL, the Cardinals picked him with the 12th overall pick, and the Jets picked him with the first overall pick. Now, the owner of the Jets at the time, a guy named Sonny Werbling, Werbling he was... Um, he was kind of a, 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 a show business guy. He was a, a entertainment executive, and, and he kind of understood star quality. And he really believed to have a successful entertainment business, which is what he viewed football as, you, you really needed someone to sell tickets, and you needed someone with that, that charisma and that pizzazz and that it factor, if you will. And he really thought Joe Namath was that guy. And so he went hard after Joe Namath. Um, Namath ended up accepting the Jets' offer, which was a $427,000 contract for three years, which at the time was just, it was an insane amount of money. And um, so he ends up signing with the Jets. That summer, uh, shortly before he started playing for the Jets, he found himself on the cover of the Sports Illustrated magazine. And had him in the background, you see New York City, and it says, football goes showbiz. So I think that's really interesting because it really shows you how Werbling was, was really trying to promote Joe Namath and, and really build that star factor in his young quarterback in, in hopes of selling a lot of tickets. And, and it worked because they actually, in the first year that Namath was there, they tripled their normal or their uh, season ticket sales from the previous season. So it was obviously, it seemed like it was kind of working as far as all of that goes. Um, now, kind of getting back to, does he belong in the Hall of Fame? I, I think one of the things that's often lost, and this is one of the things that kind of bothers me about the, the Hall of Fame and just in general people kind of comparing eras, is it's really hard to compare eras. And I think sometimes too many people kind of get caught up in advanced analytics and, and they worry too much about stats 
when they really never even saw the player play. Now, personally, I saw Joe Namath play in one game. That was his last game that he ever played um, for the for the Los Angeles Rams. He was actually playing for the Rams at the time. It was on a Monday night. And interestingly enough, it, it was kind of my first kind of exposure to Joe Namath and how I found out the legend of Joe Namath. It, it was it was interesting. It's um, It was a Monday night football game. And my mother, who had grown up in New York, in upstate New York, uh, knew of Joe Namath. And she was kind of telling me a little bit about Joe Namath and, and how good he was and all of that. Now, as the game kind of unfolded, he didn't play well. He got pretty well beat down. And it ended up being his very last game that he ever played in. And But what I find interesting, and I didn't realize this at the time, and I really kind of started realizing it when I started putting this video together, um, I believe that that kind of piqued my interest in football, just Joe Namath and my mom talking about him and that kind of thing. Um, 1977 was the first year that I, I watched football, and the previous year I'd watched the Super Bowl. I'd watched Super Bowl XI, which had the uh, Minnesota Vikings versus the, versus the Oakland Raiders. So this was kind of my first year of watching football, and I was kind of learning the sport and learning about it and learning some of the players and that kind of thing. And, and this helped me really kind of learn about a player that, even though he was playing that season, a, a player and a legend from the past. Um, one of the things that Joe Namath brought is he did bring that star quality. I mean, he really did. He, he you know, the white shoes, and which was unheard of at the time, and just a certain swagger and the clothes that he wore and the long hair and just the nightlife and everything else. He was a superstar. He was a mega superstar. But not only was he a, a superstar, he had real talent too. Um, a lot of people, if you watch some of the, the old film of him, he could really throw the football. I mean, he had a very, very strong arm. And, you know, people talk about it, people that played with him, people that played against him, um, people that saw him play, they all respect how great of an arm he, was, he had and, and just how competitive he was. And, and he was really a tough guy, too. I mean, you see a lot, of, a lot of video where he's just, he's getting hammered. And he's not this quarterback that when he takes off running, he's going to slide and, and go down. No, he's going to take on the tackler. And... You know, he was always kind of playing hurt, always playing with, with bad knees and that kind of thing. But but he was always competing. And I think one thing that I don't hear a lot of people talk about also when they talk about Joe Namath and, and his lack of stats is he played half his games in Shea Stadium. Now, for those that don't know, Shea Stadium had the reputation of just being extremely windy. I mean, it was a very, very windy stadium, that along with uh, Candlestick Park in San Francisco. So you have to believe that that kind of affected his stats. And, and also back then, just the rules were different and the style of play was different. Defensive backs could really just beat you up. They could beat receivers up all the way down the field. They could do all kinds of things that they're not allowed to do today. And, and also, as far as that goes, you know, the quarterback today is, is really protected by a lot of different rules where, as in Joe Namath's day, quarterbacks were not protected. And, and a lot of times they were hunted. <laughs> I mean, they, they really were not protected at all. So they took a lot of punishment throughout the game and throughout the season and even throughout their, their entire careers. So me personally... I do believe Joe Namath is a Hall of Famer, very well deserving of it. And then also everyone knows about the, about the Super Bowl guarantee. And what you have to understand about that is um, the AFL was looked on by the NFL as an inferior league. And, and this really upset the, the people in the AFL because they believed they were every bit as good as the players in the NFL. And even after Super Bowl I, when um, Green Bay beat the uh, Kansas City Chiefs, Vince Lombardi was kind of snide about it when asked. And he said, well, you know, the Chiefs are a good football team, but, but they're nowhere near as good as the teams that we have in the NFL. And this really set off not just Hank Stram and the Kansas City Chiefs, who they had just beaten, but it set off everybody in the AFL. 
And it became an absolute mission to finally break through and prove that they were every bit as good as their counterparts in the NFL. Now, uh, they did not do that in Super Bowl II, but in Super Bowl III, Joe Namath had kind of had had enough of this. He got tired of hearing about how they were going to get beat down and how they were 17-point underdogs. And in anger, one one night at a, um, a function where he was accepting an award for the team, he just said, we're going to win this game. And I guarantee we're going to win this game. And I believe he really meant it. I mean, you got to understand, the the everybody in the AFL was pulling for the Jets in this game, too. They really were. They were pulling hard for them to beat the Baltimore Colts. And as the story goes, you know, they did. Joe Namath was the MVP of that Super Bowl. He's actually, I believe, the only... Um, Super Bowl MVP quarterback to ever win MVP without throwing a pass. Or, I'm sorry, not throwing a pass, but a touchdown pass. Um, Which is interesting, and you might think, well, why did he win MVP? Now, a lot of people think that Matt Snell should have won MVP, and I can actually see that argument. But I think what people don't really realize also about that particular Super Bowl is, is Joe Namath won that game every bit as much with his mind and his knowledge of the game and understanding what the defense was giving them that, than he did with, with passing the football. And he did what it took to win the football game. And that's another thing that's kind of often overlooked about Joe Namath and, and his um, football abilities. He had a very good football mind, and I think people don't really quite understand that. Um, one other accomplishment for, for Joe Namath, uh, he is one of two quarterbacks to win a national championship and a Super Bowl. And the other one is San Francisco 49er Joe Montana. So I know this is kind of a long video and, um, but you know, I really wanted to tell some of these stories because I think they're fascinating. And so I want to show some cards real quick. The cards that I do have of, of Joe Namath. The first one is the 1966 Tops. I, um, it, it's that classic wood grain TV card. I do not have the rookie card. Now I'm also missing the 71 card, the 71 Tops, the uh, both 72 Tops, the regular and the um, the in action card. And I would also like to have the Top Super from 1970 and the Super Glossy from that year as well. Um, the next card is 1967 Tops Joe Namath. Now, the interesting thing about this card is this is the card from um, the year that he threw for 4,000 yards. He is the first quarterback to throw for 4,000 yards and was the only one to do it until Dan Fouts did it three seasons in a row starting in 1979. Now, Dan Fouts would have done it a fourth year in 82, but they had a... a strike shortened season that year and even then he threw for I think 2,800 yards in nine games so he was well on his way Dan Fouts was to being the first 5,000 yard passer um, interestingly enough here's just a look at the back you see up here at the top it says AFL football on NBC for excitement now this just shows you how they were really pumping AFL football and um, NBC together. Now, Werbling was actually responsible for working out that contract, the Jets owner. He was responsible for that. So here is the 1968 Topps Joe Namath card, which is one of my favorite ones. And this is from the season that they won the Super Bowl. Give you a look at the back here. Interestingly enough, it does not talk about him throwing for 4,000 yards the previous season, which I find really interesting. This is my favorite card of Joe Namath, the 1969 Tops. Um, I love the orange background. Uh, you know, they won the Super Bowl in that January of 1969, so they're coming off of that Super Bowl win. And I really like what it says on the back. It shows... So this does show where he threw for 4,000 yards in 1967. And 
I like what it says on the back. It says, pulling off one of the greatest upsets in professional football, Joe methodically picked apart the Baltimore Colts defense to give the AFL their first Super Bowl championship team. So to me, this is just a cool card because of the history that it shows there. And then you have the 1970 Tops Joe Namath. Um, what I like about this is uh, the first football cards I saw after 1956 Tops football cards, as far as vintage cards go, were 1970 Tops football cards. Again, through a friend who whose uncle had these cards. And then this is the last card that Joe Namath had in 1970 or for Tops during his career. It was 1973 Tops. I like the old style toboggan where it has Joe on, on the toboggan there. And I think one of the great injustices for, for sports cards collectors is that we were denied a 1977 Tops card with Joe Namath in a Los Angeles Rams uniform. I think that's just a shame. But anyway, what do you guys think? Should Joe Namath be in the Hall of Fame? I definitely believe he, he does belong there. I appreciate you watching. This one was a little bit longer, but again, there, there were just some stories that... I wanted to talk about. I thought that that was important. As always, thanks for watching.